Let me show you how to be a good baby and change your predictions after taking information in. Another thing I'm curious about is how do you run the deep neural network, actually? And how much of a bottleneck is it on the sampling time, if any? Yes, it will definitely depend on your, I mean, on the, on the space. Let me rewrite. The thing is, whether or not it's going to be worth it to train neural network in order to help you sampling depends on how difficult it is for you to sample in uh, with the, the more traditional MCMCs that you have on your hand. So mm -hmm. again, if you have a multimodal distribution, it's very likely that your traditional MCMC algorithms are just not going to cut it. And so then... I mean, if you really care about sampling this posterior distribution or this distribution of configurations of a physical system, then you will be willing to pay the price on this sampling. So instead of, say, having to use a local sampler that will take you, I don't know, billions of iterations in order to see transitions between the modes, you can train a normalizing flow on a regressive model if you're discrete and then have those jumps happening every other time then it's more than more than clear that it's worth doing it. Okay. The answer is it depends quite a lot. <laughs> of course, of course. Yeah. And I guess, how does it scale with the quantity of parameters and quantity of data? So quantity of parameters, it's really this dimension I was already discussing mm -hmm. a bit about and telling you that there is a cap on what you can really expect mm -hmm. these methods will work on. I would say that if the quantity of parameters is something like tens or few hundreds, then things are going to work well, more or less mm -hmm. out of the box. Yeah. But if it's larger than this, you will likely run into trouble. Mm -hmm. And then the number of data is actually something I'm less familiar with because I'm less from the Bayesian community than, uh, than the StatMec community to start with. So my distribution doesn't, don't have data embedded in them in a sense, mm -hmm. most of the time. Mm -hmm. But for sure, what people argue, why it's a really good idea to use generative models such as normalizing flows to sample in the Bayesian context is the fact that you have an amortization going on. And what do I mean by that? I mean that you're learning a model. Once it's learned, it's learned. It's going to be easy to adjust it if things are changing a little. And with yeah. little adjustments, you're going to be able to sample yet still a very complicated distribution. So say mm -hmm. you have data that is uh, arriving online and you keep on having new uh, samples to be added to your posterior distribution, then it's very easy to just adjust the normalizing flow with a few training iterations to, uh, you know, get back to the new posterior you actually have now, given that you have this amount of data. So this is what some people call am amortization. The fact that you mm -hmm. can really encapsulate in your model all the knowledge you have so far and then just adjust it a bit and don't have to start from scratch as you would have to in other Monte Carlo methods. Yeah, so what I'm guessing is that uh, maybe the tuning time is a bit longer than a classic a a HMC, but then once you're out of tuning of the tuning phase, the sampling is going to be way faster. Yes, I think that's a, a correct way of, of putting it. Mm -hmm. And otherwise, like for the kind of the number of, I mean, the dimensionality that the algorithm is comfortable with, in general, the running times of the model, have you noticed that being like, ha has that been close to when you, you use a classic HMC or is it something you haven't done yet? No, I, I don't think I can honestly yeah. un answer this question. I think it will depend. Because it will also depend how easily your HMC reaches all the regions you actually care about. So, I mean, probably there are some distributions that are very easy for HMC to cover and where it wouldn't be, you know, worth it to train the model, but then plenty of cases where, where things are the other way around. So yeah, yeah, I can guess that's always something that's really fascinating in this algorithm world is how dependent everything is on the the use case really mm -hmm. dependent on the model and the data and so on this project on this algorithm what are the next steps for you what would you like to develop next on this algorithm precisely one of my main uh, question is how to scale 
this algorithm and we mm -hmm. kind of wrote it in an all purpose fashion and all purpose is nice, but all purpose does not scale. That's really what I'm, I'm focusing on trying to understand how we can learn structures we can know or we can learn from the system to how to explode them and put them in in order to be able to tackle more and more complex systems. So with higher, more degrees of freedom, so more parameters than what we are currently doing. So there's this. And of course, I'm also very interested in having some collaborations with people that care about actual problem that's uh, for which the, this, this method is actually solving something for them, as it's really what gives you the idea of what's next to be developed. What are the next methodologies that's will be useful to people? Can they already solve the problem? Do they need something more from you? That's a bit the, the two things I'm having a look at. Yeah, well, it definitely sounds like fun. I hope you'll be able to work on that and come up with some new, amazing, exciting papers on this. I'll be happy to, to look at that. And it was a great deep dive on this project. And I thank you for indulging on my questions, Mario. Now, if we want to De zoom a bit and talk about other things you do. You're also interested, you mentioned that in the context of scarce data. I'm curious on what you're doing on these, if you could elaborate a bit. Yes. So I guess what I mean by scarce data is precisely that when we are using machine learning in scientific computing, mm -hmm. usually what we're doing is exploiting the great tool that are deep neural networks to, you know, play the role of a surrogate model somewhere in our scientific computation. But yeah. most of the time, this is without data a priori. We know that there is a function we want to approximate somewhere, but in order to have data, either we have to, to pay the price of costly experiments, costly observations, or we have to pay the price of costly numerics. So if you, I mean, a very famous example of applications of machine learning to uh, scientific computing is molecular dynamics at mm -hmm. quantum precision. So this is what people call density functional theory. So if you want to observe the dynamics of a molecule with the accuracy of what's going on really at the level of quantum mechanics, then you have to make very, very costly call to a function that predicts what's the energy uh, predicted so by quantum mechanics and what are the forces predicted by quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. So people have seen here an opportunity to use deep neural nets in order to just regress what's the value of this quantum potential at the different locations that you're going to visit. And the idea is that you are creating your own data. You are deciding when you are going to pay the price of do the full numerical computation and then obtain a training point of given Cartesian coordinates. What is the value of this energy here? And then you have to conversely to what you're doing traditionally in machine learning, where you believe that you have huge data sets that are encapsulating a role and you're going to try to exploit them at best. Here, you have the choice of where you create your data and you, of course, have to be as smart as possible in order to have to create as little as possible training points. Yeah. And so this is this idea of, of working with scarce data uh, that has to be infused in the usage of machine learning in scientific computing. And my example of application is just what we have discussed, where we want to learn a deep generative model, whereas when we start, we just have our target distribution as an objective, but we don't have any sample from it that would be the traditional data that people will be using in generative modeling to train a generative model. So if you want, we are playing this adaptive game. I was already a bit eating hat where we are creating data that is not exactly the data we want, but that we believe is informative of the data we want to train the generative model that is in turn going to help us to converge the MCMC and in the same time as you are training your model, generate the data you would have needed to train your model. That is really cool. Let me show you how to be a good Bayesian. Change your predictions after taking information in. 